Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody dies, don't they? The Beast of Averroin by Clark Ashton Smith. Old age, like a moth in some fading arras, will gnaw my memories over soon, as it gnaws the memories of all men. Therefore, I, Luc de Chaudronnier, sometime known as astrologer and sorcerer, write this account of the true origin and slaying of the Beast of Averroin. And when I have ended, the writing shall be sealed in a brazen box, and the box be set in a secret chamber of my house at Zim, so that no man shall learn the verity of this matter till many years and decades have gone by. Indeed, it were not well for such evil prodigies to be divulged while any who took part in them are still on the earthward side of purgatory. And at present the truth is known only to me, and to certain others who are sworn to maintain secrecy. As all men know, the advent of the beast was coeval with the coming of that red comet which rose behind the dragon in the early summer of 1369. Like Satan's rutilant hair trailing on the wind of Gehenna as he hastens worldward, the comet streamed nightly above Averroin, bringing the fear of bale and pestilence in its train. And soon the rumour of a strange evil, a foulness unheard of in any legend, passed among the people. To Brother Jerome of the Benedictine Abbey of Perigon, it was given to behold this evil ere the horror thereof became manifest to others. Returning late to the monastery from an errand in St. Zenobi, Jerome was overtaken by darkness. No moon arose to lantern his way through the forest, but between the gnarled boughs of antic oaks he saw the vengefully streaming fire of the comet which seemed to pursue him as he went. And Jerome felt an eerie fear of the pit-deep shadows, and he made haste towards the abbey postern. Passing among the ancient trees that towered thickly behind Perigon, he thought that he discerned a light from the windows and was much cheered thereby. But going on, he saw that the light was near at hand, beneath a lowering bough. It moved as with the flitting of a fen fire, and was of changeable colour, being pale as a corpusant, or ruddy as new spilled blood, or green as the poisonous distillation that surrounds the moon. Then, with terror ineffable, Jerome beheld the thing to which the light clung like a hellish nimbus, moving as it moved, and revealing dimly the black abomination of head and limbs that were not those of any creature wrought by God. The horror stood erect, rising to more than the height of a tall man, and it swayed like a great serpent, and its members undulated, bending like heated wax. The flat black head was thrust forward on a snakish neck, the eyes, small and lidless, glowing like coals from a wizard's brazier, were set low and near together in a noseless face above the serrate gleaming of such teeth as might belong to a giant bat. This much and no more Jerome saw ere the thing went past him with its nimbus flaring from venomous green to a wrathful red. Of its actual shape, and the number of its limbs he could form no just notion. Running and slithering rapidly, it disappeared among the antique oaks, and he saw the hellish light no more. Nigh dead with fear, Jerome reached the abbey postern and sought admittance, and the porter, hearing the tale of that which he had met in the moonless wood, forbore to chide him for his tardiness. Before knowns, on the morrow, a dead stag was found in the forest behind Perigon. It had been slain in some ungodly fashion, not by wolf or poacher or hunter. It was unmarked by any wound other than a wide gash that had laid open the spine from neck to tail. The spine itself had been shattered and the white marrow sucked therefrom, but no other portion had been devoured. None could surmise the nature of the beast that slew and ravened in such fashion. 
But the good brothers, heedful of the story told by Jerome, believed that some creature from the pit was abroad in Averroin. And Jerome marvelled at the mercy of God, which had permitted him to escape the doom of the stag. Now, night by night, the comet greatened, burning like an evil mist of blood and fire, while the stars blenched before it. And day by day, from peasants, priests, woodcutters, and others who came to the abbey, the Benedictines heard tales of fearsome and mysterious depredations. Dead wolves were found with their chines laid open and the white marrow gone, and an ox and a horse were treated in like fashion. Then, it seemed, the unknown beast grew bolder, or else it wearied of such humble prey as the creatures of farm and forest. At first it did not strike at living men, but assailed the dead, like some foul eater of carrion. Two freshly buried corpses were found lying in the cemetery at St. Zenobi, where the thing had dug them from their graves and had bared their vertebrae. In each case only a little of the marrow had been eaten, but, as if in rage or disappointment, the cadavers had been torn asunder, and the tatters of their flesh were mixed with the rags of their cerements. From this it would seem that only the spinal marrow of creatures newly killed was pleasing to the monster. Thereafterward the dead were not again molested, but on the night following the desecration of the graves, two charcoal burners who plied their trade in the forest not far from Perigon were slain in their hut. Other charcoal burners dwelling nearby heard the shrill screams that fell to sudden silence, and peering fearfully through the chinks of their bolted doors, they saw anon in the starlight the departure of a black, obscenely glowing shape that issued from the hut. Not till dawn did they dare to verify the fate of their fellows, who had been served in the same manner as the stag, the wolves, and the corpses. Theophile, the abbot of Perigon, was much exercised over this evil that had chosen to manifest itself in the neighbourhood, and whose depredations were all committed within a few hours' journey of the abbey. Pale from over-strict austerities and vigils, he called the monks before him in assembly, and a martial ardour against the minions of Asmodai blazed in his hollowed eyes as he spoke. Truly, he said, there is a great devil among us that has risen with the comet from Malebolge. We, the brothers of Perigon, must go forth with cross and holy water to hunt the devil in its hidden lair, which lies haply at our very portals. So, on the forenoon of that same day, Theophile, together with Jerome and six others chosen for their hardihood, sallied forth and made search of the forest for miles around. They entered with lit torches and lifted crosses the deep caves to which they came, but found no fiercer thing than wolf or badger. Also they searched the crumbling vaults of the deserted castle of Fosflam, which was said to be haunted by vampires but nowhere could they trace the monster or find any sign of its lairing. With nightly deeds of terror beneath the comet's blasting, the middle summer went by. Men, women, children, to the number of more than forty, were done to death by the beast, which, though seeming to haunt mainly the environs of the abbey, ranged afield at times even to the shores of the river Isoil and the gates of La Frenay and Zim. There were those who beheld it by night, a black and slithering foulness clad in changeable luminescence, but no man saw it by day. And always the thing was silent, uttering no sound, and was swifter in its motion than the weaving viper. Once, it was seen by moonlight in the abbey garden as it glided toward the forest between rows of peas and turnips. Then, coming in darkness, it struck within the walls. 
Without waking the others on whom it must have cast a Lethian spell, it took Brother Jerome slumbering on his pallet at the end of the row in the dormitory. And the fell deed was not discovered till daybreak, when the monk who slept nearest to Jerome awakened and saw his body, which lay face downward with the back of the robe and the flesh beneath in bloody tatters. A week later, it came and dealt likewise with Brother Augustine, and in spite of exorcisms and the sprinkling of holy water at all doors and windows, it was seen afterward gliding along the monastery halls, and it left an unspeakably blasphemous sign of its presence in the chapel. Many believed that it menaced the abbot himself, for Brother Constantine the Cellarer, returning late from a visit to Villon, saw it by starlight as it climbed the outer wall toward that window of Theophile's cell which faced the great forest. And seeing Constantine, the thing dropped to the ground like a huge ape and vanished among the trees. Great was the scandal of these happenings and the consternation of the monks. Sorely, it was said, the matter preyed on the abbot who kept his cell in unremitting prayer and vigil. Pale and meagre as a dying saint he grew, mortifying the flesh till he tottered with weakness and a feverish illness devoured him visibly. More and more, apart from this haunting of the monastery, the horror fared afield even invading walled towns. Toward the middle of August, when the comet was beginning to decline a little, there occurred the grievous death of Sister Thérèse, the young and beloved niece of Theophile, killed by the hellish beast in her cell at the Benedictine coven of Zim. On this occasion, the monster was met by late passes in the streets, and others watched it climb the city ramparts, running like some enormous beetle or spider on the sheer stone as it fled from Zim to regain its hidden lair. In her dead hands, it was told, the pious Thérèse held tightly clasped a letter from Theophile, in which he had spoken at some length of the dire happenings at the monastery, and had confessed his grief and despair at being unable to cope with the satanic horror. All this, in the course of the summer, came to me in my house at Zim. From the beginning, because of my commerce with occult things and the powers of darkness, the unknown beast was the subject of my concern. I knew that it was no creature of earth or of the terrene hells, but regarding its actual character and genesis I could learn no more at first than any other. Vainly I consulted the stars and made use of geomancy and necromancy, and the familiars whom I interrogated professed themselves ignorant, saying that the beast was altogether alien and beyond the ken of sublunar spirits. Then I bethought me of that strange oracular ring which I had inherited from my fathers, who were also wizards. The ring had come down from ancient Hyperborea and had once been the property of the sorcerer Ibon. It was made of a redder gold than any that the earth had yielded in latter cycles, and was set with a large purple gem, sombre and smouldering, whose like is no longer to be found. In the gem, an antique demon was held captive, a spirit from pre-human worlds, which would answer the interrogation of sorcerers. So, from a rarely opened casket, I brought out the ring and made such preparations as were needful for the questioning. And when the purple stone was held inverted above a small brazier filled with hotly burning amber, the demon made answer, speaking in a shrill voice that was like the singing of fire. It told me the origin of the beast, which had come from the red comet, and belonged to a race of stellar devils that had not visited the earth since the foundering of Atlantis, and it told me the attributes of the beast, which in its own proper form was invisible and intangible to men, 
and could manifest itself only in a fashion supremely abominable. Moreover, it informed me of the one method by which the beast could be vanquished if overtaken in a tangible shape. Even to me, the student of darkness, these revelations were a source of horror and surprise, and for many reasons I deemed the mode of exorcism a doubtful and perilous thing. But the demon had sworn that there was no other way. Musing on that which I had learned, I waited among my books and alembics, for the stars had warned me that my intervention would be required in good time. To me, following the death of Sister Thérèse, there came privily the Marshal of Zim, together with the Abbot Theophile, in whose worn features and bowed form I described the ravages of mortal sorrow and horror and humiliation. And the two, albeit with palpable hesitancy, asked my advice and assistance in the laying of the beast. You, Monsieur Le Chaudronnier, said the Marshal, are reputed to know the arcanic arts of sorcery and the spells which summon and dismiss demons. Therefore, in dealing with this devil, it may be that you shall succeed where all others have failed. Not willingly do we employ you in the matter, since it is not seemly for the church and the law to ally themselves with wizardry. But the need is desperate, lest the demon should take other victims. In return for your aid, we can promise you a goodly reward of gold and a guarantee of lifelong immunity from all inquisition which your doings might otherwise invite. The Bishop of Zim and the Archbishop of Villon are privy to this offer, which must be kept secret. I ask no reward, I replied, if it be in my power to rid Averroin of this scourge. But you have set me a difficult task, and one that is happily attended by strange perils. All assistance that can be given you shall be yours to command, said the marshal. Men at arms shall attend you, if need be. Then Theophile, speaking in a low, broken voice, assured me that all doors, including those of the Abbey of Perigon, would be opened at my request, and that everything possible would be done to further the laying of the fiend. I reflected briefly and said, Go now, but send to me an hour before sunset two men at arms mounted and with a third steed, and let the men be chosen for their valour and discretion. For this very night I shall visit Perigon, where the horror seems to centre. Remembering the advice of the gem-imprisoned demon, I made no preparation for the journey except to place upon my index fing the ring of Ibon, and to arm myself with a small hammer which I placed at my girdle in lieu of a sword. Then I awaited the set hour when the men and the horses came to my house, as had been stipulated. The men were stout and tested warriors, clad in chain mail and carrying swords and halberds. I mounted the third horse, a black and spirited mare, and we rode forth from Zim towards Perigon, taking a direct and little used way which ran through the werewolf-haunted forest. My companions were taciturn, speaking only in answer to some question, and then briefly. This pleased me, for I knew they would maintain a discreet silence regarding that which might occur before dawn. Swiftly we rode, while the sun sank in a redness as of welling blood among the tall trees, and soon the darkness wove its thickening webs from bough to bough, closing upon us like some inexorable net of evil. Deeper we went into the brooding woods, and even I, the master of sorceries, trembled a little at the knowledge of all that was abroad in the darkness. Undelayed and unmolested, however, we came to the abbey, at late moonrise, when all the monks except the aged porter had retired to their dormitory. 
The abbot, returning at sunset from Zim, had given word to the porter of our coming, and he would have admitted us, but this, as it happened, was no part of my plan. Saying I had reason to believe the beast would re-enter the abbey that very night, I told the porter of my intention of waiting outside the walls to intercept it, and merely asked him to accompany us in a tour of the building's exterior so that he could point out the various rooms. This he did, and during the tour he indicated a certain window in the second story as being that of Theophile's cell. The window faced the forest, and I remarked the abbot's rashness in leaving it open. This, uh, the porter told me, was his invariable custom, in spite of the oft-repeated demoniac invasions of the monastery. Behind the window we saw the glimmering of a taper, as if the abbot were keeping late vigil. We had committed our horses to the porter's care. After he had conducted us around the building and had left us, we returned to the space before Theophile's window, and began our long watch. Pale and hollow as the face of a corpse, the moon rose higher, swimming above the sombre oaks, and pouring a spectral silver on the grey stone of the abbey walls. In the west, the comet flamed among the lustreless signs, veiling the lifted sting of the scorpion as it sank. We waited hour by hour in the shortening shadow of a tall oak where none could see us from the windows. When the moon had passed over, sloping westward, the shadow began to lengthen toward the wall. All was mortally still, and we saw no movement apart from the slow shifting of the light and shade. Halfway between midnight and dawn, the taper went out in Theophile's cell, as if it had burned to the socket, and thereafter the room remained dark. Unquestioning, with ready weapons, the men at arms companioned me in that vigil. Well they knew the demonian terror which they might face before dawn, but there was no trepidation in their bearing, and knowing much that they could not know, I drew the ring of Ibon from my finger and made ready for that which the demon had directed me to do. The men stood nearer than I to the forest, facing it perpetually according to a strict order that I had given. But nothing stirred in the fretted gloom, and the slow night ebbed, and the skies grew paler as if with morning twilight. Then, an hour before sunrise, when the shadow of the great oak had reached the wall and was climbing towards Theophile's window, there came the thing I had anticipated. Very suddenly it came, and without forewarning of its nearness, a horror of hellish red light, swift as a kindling wind-blown flame that leapt from the forest gloom and sprang upon us where we stood stiff and weary from our night-long vigil. One of the men-at-arms was borne to the ground, and I saw above him, in a floating redness as of ghostly blood, the black and semi-serpentine form of the beast. A flat and snakish head, without ears or nose, was tearing at the man's armour with sharp, serrate teeth, and I heard the teeth clash and grate on the linked iron. Swiftly I laid the ring of Ibon on a stone I had placed in readiness and broke the dark jewel with a blow of the hammer that I carried. From the pieces of the lightly shattered gem the disimprisoned demon rose in the form of a smoky fire, small as a candle flame at first, and greatening like the conflagration of piled faggots, and hissing softly with the voice of fire and brightening to a wrathful, terrible gold, the demon leapt forward to do battle with the beast, even as it had promised me, in return for its freedom after cycles of captivity. 
It closed upon the beast with a vengeful flaring, tall as the flame of an auto da fe, and the beast relinquished the man at arms on the ground beneath it and writhed back like a burnt serpent. The body and members of the beast were loathfully convulsed, and they seemed to melt in the manner of wax and to change dimly and horribly beneath the flame, undergoing an incredible metamorphosis. Moment by moment, like a werewolf that returns from its beasthood, the thing took on the wavering similitude of man. The unclean blackness flowed and swirled, assuming the weft of cloth amid its changes and becoming the folds of a dark robe and cowl, such as are worn by the Benedictines. Then, from the cowl, a face began to peer, and the face, though shadowy and distorted, was that of the abbot Theophile. This prodigy I beheld for an instant, and the men also beheld it, but still the fire-shaped demon assailed the abhorrently transfigured thing, and the face melted again into waxy blackness, and a great column of sooty smoke arose, followed by an odour as of burning flesh commingled with some mighty foulness. And out of the volumed smoke, above the hissing of the demon, there came a single cry in the voice of Theophile. But the smoke thickened, hiding both the assailant and that which it assailed, and there was no sound other than the singing of fed fire. At last the sable fumes began to lift, ascending and disappearing amid the boughs, and the dancing golden light in the shape of a will-o'-the-wisp went soaring over the dark trees towards the stars. And I knew that the demon of the ring had fulfilled its promise, and had now gone back to those remote and ultra-mundane deeps from which the sorcerer Ibon had drawn it down in Hyperborea to become the captive of the purple gem. The stench of burning passed from the air, together with the mighty foulness, and of that which had been the beast there was no longer any trace. So I knew that the horror born of the red comet had been driven away by the fiery demon, the fallen man-at-arms had risen unharmed beneath his mail, and he and his fellows stood beside me, saying naught. But I knew that they had seen the changes of the beast, and had divined something of the truth. So while the moon grew grey with the nearness of dawn, I made them swear an awful oath of secrecy, and enjoined them to bear witness to the statement I must make before the monks of Perigon. Then, Having settled this matter so that the good renown of the holy Theophile should suffer no calumny, we aroused the porter. We averred that the beast had come upon us unaware and had gained the abbot's cell before we could prevent it, and had come forth again, carrying Theophile with its snakish members as if to bear him away to the sunken comet. I had exorcised the unclean devil, which had vanished in a cloud of sulphurous fire and vapour, and... Most unluckily, the abbot had been consumed by the fire. His death, I said, was a true martyrdom, and would not be in vain. The beast would no longer plague the country or bedevil Perigon, since the exorcism I had used was infallible. This tale was accepted without question by the brothers, who grieved mightily for their good abbot. Indeed, the tale was true enough, for Theophile had been innocent and was wholly ignorant of the foul change that came upon him nightly in his cell, and the deeds that were done by the beast through his loathfully transfigured body. Each night the thing had come down from the passing comet to assuage its hellish hunger, and being otherwise impalpable and powerless, it had used the abbots for its energumen, moulding his flesh in the image of some obscene monster from beyond the stars. It had slain a peasant girl in St. Zenobi on that night while we waited behind the abbey. But thereafter the beast was seen no more in Averroin, and its murderous deeds were not repeated. In time the comet passed to other heavens, fading slowly, and the black terror it had wrought became a varying legend, even as all other bygone things. 
The abbot Theophile was canonized for his strange martyrdom, and they who read this record in future ages will believe it not, saying that no demon or malign spirit could have prevailed thus upon true holiness. Indeed, it were well that none should believe the story, for thin is the veil betwixt man and the godless deep. The skies are haunted by that which it were madness to know, and strange abominations pass evermore between earth and moon and athwart the galaxies. Unnameable things have come to us in alien horror, and will come again. And the evil of the stars is not as the evil of earth. If you like that story, consider supporting me as a patron. That way you help me make more stories for you and get access to a patron's only library of stories. Lots more hours for you to listen to. The Beast of Averroin by Clark Ashton Smith. Um, I was reading that from a paper copy, so you may have heard the turning of the pages, which some people say it actually enhances it. Um, you can see the Lovecraftian stuff there, but I thought it was about time we had a bit of Clark Ashton Smith. I've done two of his stories before, one being Rendezvous in Averroin, set in this same quasi south of France, haunted by werewolves and nameless, blasphemous, unknowable and nameable terrors from beyond the stars. Um, very weird tales in it. I'm going to say something about Clark Ashton Smith. Also, we did a very another one um, that was mo much more um, kind of it was set in Cornwall. I think it was like a standard um, kind of horror story. The, these, this is probably a weird tale. I like Clark Ashton Smith, and his style is very different, you know. And one of the pleasures of reading different stories is the different writers. We can go from some a kind of a, a modern, very modern um, diction to this baroque prolix, verbose, over-elaborate style. But it has its own charm, isn't it? It's like we might we might go for, if we were de decorating our house, we might go for a kind of a very minimalist look, like something from Finland or Japan. Or we might go for ultra-baroque, you know, every little corner has a decoration. And I think that's old Clark Ashton Smith does that. So let me say something about his biography. I almost gave myself a funny turn during that. I could feel as I was going, I was really kind of... Uh, over the top, you know, which was pleasurable, but I could feel, I could feel my body kind of, um, my heart was going faster, and um, I thought, oh, I feel quite peculiar. But um, anyway, uh, I can go back to normal now. Right, let's say something about Clark. So at a bit of a gallop, you know, we don't have tons of time. Clark Ashton Smith, born 1893 in Long Valley, California. Smith came from a family of English and New England heritage. He spent most of his life in Auburn, California, where he lived in a cabin built by his parents, Fanny and Timmius Smith. Due to psychological disorders, Smith's, you can probably get that from the story, Smith's formal education was limited and he was taught at home after attending eight years of grammar school. Smith was an insatiable reader with an extraordinary eidetic memory, photographic memory we might say, and he read voraciously, including works by Edgar Allan Poe, Hans Christian Andersen and others. He even read the entire 11th edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica twice. His early literary efforts included fairy tales and imitations of the Arabian Nights, which he began writing at the age of 11. He sold several tales to The Black Cat, a magazine specialising in unusual stories at the age of 17. Um, Smith's poetic talents blossomed, leading to acclaimed volumes like The Star Treader and other poems and odes and sonnets. He was mentored by San Francisco poet George Sterling and gained international acclaim for his poetry. Smith transitioned to weird fiction during the period of 1926 to 35, possibly influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. He created a plethora of imaginative creatures and wrote stories set in various fictional lands like Averroin, Hapaburia and Zotik. Or Zothique. Um, he, from 35, his interest in fiction waned and he turned to sculpture, primarily using soft rock materials like soapstone. He was part of the Lovecraft circle and had a lasting literary friendship with H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft wrote to loads of people and didn't necessarily meet them, but they had these ongoing over years, different people. Um, Smith also corresponded with uh, Robert E. Howard, you know, the Texan, um, Conan the Barbarian and all those kind of stories, and E. Hoffman Price. Clark Ashton Smith's work is celebrated for its rich vocabulary, cosmic perspective and sardonic humour. His weird fiction has been compared to the Dying Earth sequence of Jack Vance. 
Smith's writing style aimed to captivate readers by using a variety of stylistic resources akin to incantations. This is a really important thing. So clearly he was a poet first and foremost. And you might say, like I said, why do you have to use all them big words, Clark? Why can't you just speak plain English? And um, But the point is, he... Um, his work was intended to be like a spell. So he was interested in the occult and and the power of... I don't know if you know much about the Golden Dawn, but the Golden Dawn were like a bunch of Victorian magicians. And they have a, um, they have a saying, uh, uh, by words and images are all powers awakened and reawakened. So it's the use of images, who's a sculptor, and the use of words that awakens these powers in us. And we may not believe in magic or spirits, but in some sense, I think Ashton Smith is trying to conjure us, is conjuring things through his words, conjuring states of mind. I'm thinking of um, Smith's contemporary, Austin Osman Spare, considered the first chaos, chaos magician, English artist and occultist, a contemporary of Smith's, who again used words definitely, definitely as magical spells. So I think that is really interesting. Um, and you can kind of wonder what magic, magic spells really are, but certainly that he is intending to use his words to conjure emotions out of us. And as I said, I felt quite funny, peculiar while I was reading that. Um, and so, you know, and, and I wasn't, I wasn't sitting out to be, and I've read a lot of stories, you know, so, and of all of them, that was one of the ones that really kind of, um, it did something physiological to me, I think, anyway, 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 so there we are. So, uh, at 54, at the age of 61, he married, uh, Carolyn Jones Dorman, a woman with experience in Hollywood and public relations, radio public relations. They lived in Pacific Grove and Smith continued sculpting during this period. In 61, he passed away quietly in his sleep at the age of 68. His ashes were buried near his childhood home and plaques recognising his contributions have been erected in Auburn, California. Clark Ashton Smith was marked by fascinating blend of artistic pursuits from poetry and weird fiction to sculpture. His imaginative worlds and unique style continue to captivate readers and stand as testament to his enduring legacy in the realms of literature and art. Yeah, fair enough, you can't say more than that, can you? So this is probably going to be quite a short episode, um, mainly because I've got to nip off and um, go and buy some dog food. So the, the issue is that the dogs... Um, Sheila's in charge of the dog's menus, really, and uh, I don't interfere too much. I just go and get it. And so she's into raw food. She believes raw food's best for them. So you can't just get that everywhere. So there's a particular place that's up near Longtown, near the Scottish border. It's, and that sounds like a long way, but it's not. Uh, it's about a 10-minute drive, 15 possibly. And um, I, my task is to go and get that, and I need to go before they shut so it's Saturday, which is, I don't know if you know this, but Saturday is the day I do the classic ghost stories episode. Monday, Monday afternoons is when I do the long pieces. So we're doing um, an Algernon Blackwood story at the moment, uh, Descent into Egypt. And, and this, the Mondays is the one I've always done the novels, the novel length stuff, Haunting of Hill House and all that kind of thing. Uh, and these are the shorter ones. So this is a short one for the reason I've just explained. And also I'm feeling... No, I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not ill. I'm just um, a bit spaced out by that story. So, for its weird power. In terms of the story, my, I was, we'd have our um, book club every couple of weeks on Discord, and uh, we were discussing one of them, and somebody, somebody made the point that sometimes my rambles after the story don't really talk about the story, and I think that's a fair point. So what do we want to say about this story? We want to say that um, the language we've talked about, the story itself is, uh, what he does is, and he's not alone in doing this, certainly um, Lovecraft did this by mentioning his ancient tomes. He would drop a tome in, sometimes one that he talked about before, and created, like the Necronomicon, it's not a real book, but it has become a real book, so almost like conjuring it out of nowhere to become a real thing. And so Lovecraft drops these things. Tolkien certainly did that as well. So if you read The Lord of the Rings, and there's a, there's a part really early on, they're singing about Gil-galad. So even before anything had been published that we could read about Gil-galad, who's now been on Amazon, um, he, um, 
he was alluding to it and it, it's a technique for giving depth to a story so he's alluding to hyperborea and different items and he's using the Averroin cycle so it creates it's world building isn't it it's kind of that uh, what do you say in French trompe d'oeil where you you deceive the eye and you draw something that looks like it's got perspective but it hasn't and in a sense this is what I think he's doing with with these references but it's not a wrong thing to do it works and um, so he does that there's a the language and the other thing in terms of the plot fairly straightforward you know, nothing surprising, really. You probably guessed it was the abbot. He dropped, he foreshadowed it, didn't he? The, the abbot is the one who doesn't get killed. He goes and visits Therese and uh, has a letter from Théophile. And I think the only question was, was the abbot complicit? Was the abbot a knowing shapeshifter? But it turns out he wasn't. He was an innocent victim. And I suppose the frame story is at the beginning he's going to hide these stories away. And that is another foreshadowing device as well, because... Do you know what it's like saying, I'm going to tell you something later, something really interesting. And then he delays that to the end and then you've got the nice little frame around it because he goes, yeah, well, what is interesting is this. And that's at the very end after the story. So he does do that. Um, yeah, so, but th these are just techniques uh, and you, you can definitely do that. And you can do things like, um, you know, um, the reason I was in Chinatown you know, I mean, you wouldn't say, I'll tell you later. There was a reason I was in Chinatown. You just allude to it, an important reason. And that day, and then you're going like, what was that important reason? And you've created what they call Zygarnic tension and the person. And the reason, with fiction, you just need to keep raising questions in, in the listener, the reader's mind, that they, they want answers to that. And they can be quite small questions, but as long as there's open questions... They're open loops, the reader is drawn in, and that is the technique to get them to read, I suppose. So, yeah, he does that. It's, it wasn't a surprise, was it? He could have double-twisted it and made it not the abbot. He could have kind of red-herringed it. I don't think that's a verb, but you know what I mean. Made it into a red herring and got us to think it was the abbot and then switch and bait. No, it wasn't the abbot, it was somebody else. But um, And that's another technique, but he doesn't do that. I think the story is really simple, but... Um, it, I liked it. I liked the milieu. I liked the language. And I like Averroin, to be honest. Of all of these um, worlds, I, I like Averroin, this uh, kind of medieval, quasi-medieval sorcerer's place. Anyway, hope you're all well. I better go and get that dog food. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?